scientists, are you ready to observe, explore, and discover? It's time for Fun Lab TV! From sunny Los Angeles, let's go to the California Science Center with your hosts, Mariela and Monica. Hi, scientists! Welcome to Fun Lab TV here at the California Science Center. Our show is made up of three segments that show you how science happens here, here, and everywhere. First, follow us as we guide you through our virtual field trip. Together, we'll explore the California Science Center and answer a question of the day. Next, we'll ask you to get curious and make observations in Check It Out. Wait, when do we do science? Well, you may be thinking that since this is a TV show, we won't be doing science. Ha ha! Think again, scientists. Our final segment is called Stuck at Home Science, where we explore a science concept with materials you can find at home. So scientists, that means you'll need some supplies. Don't worry, we'll give you enough time to get what you need. Here's a list of the things you'll need for the show today. While you watch, have an adult help you find what you need. Today you'll need construction paper of any color, water, paint, a resealable bag, scissors, color pencils or markers, and you'll need a pencil and paper or a notebook for the whole show to help you keep track of everything we discover. I think we're ready, scientists! On with the show! Hi scientists, welcome to Virtual Field Trips at the California Science Center. Before we get started, there are a few things we need to go over. All Virtual Field Trips will have a question of the day. And today's question is, how do organisms fuel themselves to survive? This is the question we will be investigating today. Feel free to draw or write notes in your notebook to help you answer the question. All virtual field trips will also have a buzzword. Today's buzzword is... Energy. Anytime you hear this word, be sure to make check marks or tally marks somewhere in your notebook to keep track of how many times you hear the buzzword. Okay, I think we're ready for a virtual field trip. Let's go! Let's start our field trip in the Rose Garden. Scientists, this is a radiometer. It looks a little bit like a light bulb. But when you zoom in, it's a little bit different. Can you figure out how it works? Draw or write down your answer in your science notebook as we continue our virtual field trip. What do you notice about my surroundings? Is the radiometer moving? As I start walking out from the shade and towards the sunlight, what do you notice? Is the radiometer moving now? How do you think the radiometer gets its energy? Draw or write down your answer in your science notebook as we continue our virtual field trip. The radiometer uses energy from the sun to move. That energy heats up the black panes inside the radiometer faster than white panes because black absorbs more heat. As the heat builds up around the black panes, the pressure also increases. To equalize this pressure, the cooler air around the white panes moves towards the black panes, causing the radiometer to spin. So the radiometer uses energy from the sun in order to move, but we're talking about how organisms get energy from other places. Can you think of any organisms behind me that might use energy from the sun to survive? Draw or write down your answer in your science notebook as we continue our virtual field trip. 
Did you guess plants use energy from the sun? Then you're right. Plants use a process called photosynthesis to make food to fuel themselves. Plants absorb the energy of the sun through their leaves, but that's not the only thing they absorb. Plants also absorb carbon dioxide through their leaves and water through their root system. Once plants have all they need, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, they use the energy from the sun to convert the water and carbon dioxide into a sugar called glucose, which they use to survive. Hmm. I know that plants get energy from the sun, but there are other organisms in this rose garden. How do they get their energy? Draw or write down your answer in your science notebook as we continue our virtual field trip. Did you see the ants on the tree? Take a closer look. What do you think the fly is looking for? How do spider webs help a spider to survive? Does this moth get the nectar out of the plant? What is this bee doing? What could this June bug be looking for? What is this bird doing in the water? How else do birds use water? Why is this squirrel hiding its food? Now that we've explored the rose garden and the organisms that live here, let's check out the animals and organisms that live in our kelp forest. Oh wait, what was the question of the day? 
Do you have it in your notes? How do organisms fuel themselves to survive? Okay, just check. Hi, Dr. Chuck. Scientists, this is Dr. Chuck, curator of life sciences here at the California Science Center. And he's gonna be talking to us a little bit about the food web in our kelp forests. So just like plants on the land that need sunlight to survive and make their own food and grow, plants or algae really that are found in the ocean, like giant kelp, have that same need. They actually grow from the bottom of the ocean to the surface in order to get the sunlight that they need to grow. By doing that, they create these complex forests that then support entire food webs of animals. The kelp itself doesn't usually get eaten by too much but a lot of things crawl across it, eating other smaller things that live on it as well. There are animals, of course, like snails, abalone snails, giant uh, keyhole limpet snails, all kinds of snails that spend their time grazing on algae. They actually have special tongues that help them scrape algae off the rocks. Then, of course, we have animals that will eat those snails or eat other animals, things like crabs, lobsters, some fish. Um, and then as we move up the food chain farther, eventually we get to animals like sea otters. Now we don't have sea otters here in Southern California right now, but maybe someday they'll come back. But sea otters are considered to be the sort of the top of the natural food chain in kelp forests. And they'll eat, like I said, they'll eat crabs, they'll eat sea stars, they'll eat fish, they'll eat almost anything and they're very good at controlling other populations of animals that are all part of the complex food web in the kelp forest. Scientists, today we are going to play Algae Says. Have you ever played Algae Says? You haven't? Well, no problem. Monica and I are gonna teach you how to play. So make sure you stand up and have enough space around you to play along. Now, before we start, we actually need to go underwater and find some algae. Let's go! Okay, Monica will model each part of the algae with movements. Make sure you follow along. Our first part is Blade. The blade is the same as a leaf on a land plant. The purpose of the blade is to absorb as much of the sunlight shining down from above. It needs that energy. Next, we have the stipe. The stipe looks similar to the stem of a land plant. The purpose of the stipe in algae is to hold the structure together which is different from a land plant because in a land plant, the purpose of the stem is to allow nutrients to travel through it. Now we have the air bladder. The air bladder is special to algae. Algae has these round bulb-like structures full of air. That air helps to keep the plant stay buoyant so that it can reach as close as it can to the surface of the ocean. Finally, we have the holdfast. The holdfast may remind you of the roots of a land plant, but they work differently. In algae, the holdfast's purpose is to keep the plant anchored to the bottom of the ocean. In a land plant, the roots are a way for the plant to get nutrients from the soil. All right, now we know all of the parts. Let's review. Blade, Stipe, air bladder, hold fast. Ready to play. The purpose of the game is to quickly turn your body into the part of algae when you hear me say, algae says. For example, algae says blade. If I just name the part of algae without saying algae says, don't change the position your body is in. For example, stipe. I didn't say algae says, so stay in the position that you're in. 
Monica will play along with you this round to help you out. Hey scientist, round one. Make sure you're listening closely. Algae says hold fast. Algae says stipe. Blade. Oh, good job, don't move. Algae says blade. Algae says air bladder. Stipe. Algae says hold fast. Blade. Algae says blade. Oh, I think maybe Monica made a mistake. That's okay. We can keep playing. Algae says stipe. Algae says blade. Algae says hold fast. Algae says air bladder. All right, you completed round one. Good job, scientists. This time, we're going to make it a little bit harder. I will be saying what Algae says, but Monica will be doing a different movement. So pay close attention to what I'm saying and not what Monica is doing. And just like last time, don't move your body if Algae doesn't say. Here we go. Algae says stipe. Algae says blade. Algae says air bladder. Stipe. Uh-oh, make sure you don't move if Algae doesn't say. Algae says air bladder. Algae says hold fast. Algae says stipe. Algae says air bladder. All right, scientists, how'd you do? Not too bad? Well, scientists, we hope you had fun playing and learning with us. Let's head back to the discovery room. Now that we're back in the discovery room, let's talk about some of the things that we learned today. In the Rose Garden, we learned how plants use the energy from the sun to grow through a process called photosynthesis. In addition to using sunlight energy, they also use air and water. We also learned about the organisms in the Rose Garden and how they get their energy from plants and other living things. Next, we visited our kelp forest with Dr. Chuck. He talked about the food web in our kelp forest and how algae and animals get their energy there. Finally, we played Algae Says to compare and contrast structures between land plants and algae. Do you remember the question of the day? How do organisms fuel themselves to survive? Can you use the buzzword to answer the question of the day? Energy. Okay, scientists, it's time to count our check marks. How many times did you hear the buzzword? Drum roll, please. And the answer is... 12. We hope you enjoyed that virtual field trip. Don't forget these materials for stuck-at-home science. Now back to the show. Can animals in the ocean taste? There are many animals in the ocean and they come in many different shapes and sizes and they all eat differently. Our taste buds are on our tongue. But do animals in the ocean have tongues? Do they even have taste buds? First, let's look at some invertebrates, specifically the echinoderms, such as sea urchins, sand dollars, and sea stars. Many stars are generalist, meaning they will eat anything edible. Others are specialists, only eating certain prey. But how can they tell the difference? As you see with the star, it's using its two feet to bring a piece of fish to its mouth. It has fairly simple sensory receptors in its epidermis that help differentiate between a rock or food. Another echinoderm is a sea urchin. This urchin looks fuzzy, but it's actually its two feet. Similar to the sea star, they have sensory receptors, but in this case, its choice of food is a piece of kelp. Switching from echinoderms to cnidarians, such as the sea anemone, as you see here, 
They have tentacles that help filter food out of the water column. As soon as the tentacle is touched, a nematocyst, which is a harpoon-like structure, is fired to catch its prey, and then the tentacle retracts. Inside the tentacles are mechanoreceptors and simple chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptor is what we would consider a taste bud. This helps differentiate between food and debris in the water. You may have noticed so far that none of the animals I've shown you actually have tongues. This crab doesn't have a tongue or even teeth. However, all of the animals that you have seen have chemoreceptors, which aid in smell and taste. If you look closely at this crab, she's eating a tasty shrimp. You will see tiny hairs around her mouth, and that's where the chemoreceptors are located. She's using her mandible and maxillopeds and other mouth parts to shred a piece of shrimp into smaller pieces, which she then eats. Now this brings us to the fish in the ocean. Did you know that sharks are fish? And that they actually have tongues. This is not a traditional tongue as we may think compared to ours. Their tongue is called a bassy hyle. It is a small, thick, relatively rigid piece of cartilage in sharks, or bone, in fish. Unlike us, they do not have taste buds on their tongue. However, in reference to fish, they are definitely stepping up their game when it comes to taste. Some fish possess as many as a hundred times the amount of taste buds as humans. Their sense of taste is used primarily for food recognition and comes in handy when recognizing potentially poisonous food. Most taste buds are located in the mouth and the throat. But some fish also have taste buds located on other parts of their body, such as their lips and snout. Thanks for watching. Bye. Stuck at home science. Stuck at home. Let's do science! Hi scientists! There is so much science we can learn just by taking a step outside. And at the California Science Center, science starts as soon as you leave your car. The first thing you may notice as you leave your car is the sound of birds. The birds you may find around the California Science Center are house sparrows, black phoebes, or hummingbirds. Bird watching is a great way to use your five senses. Bird watchers may use their nose to smell flowers, their eyes to see animal tracks, and their ears to hear the birds. Here at the California Science Center, you can walk our trail to use your five senses too. A self-guided tour? What a great way to start your trip! Oh man, this is a new lab coat. But as I said earlier, you can learn science by just stepping outside. Um, this actually reminds me of a fun activity we can try. Meet me inside? Hey scientists, now that I'm all cleaned up, let me tell you what you need. Construction paper, any color. You're gonna need water, paint, a Ziploc bag, and some kind of drawing utensil. Anything really works. We drew birds on our Ziploc bags for fun. Add paint into your bag. Water can be added to change the consistency of your bird poop. Cut the tip of your bag and be careful that the paint doesn't spill out. All animals, including birds, poop to get rid of their waste. Scientists can learn a lot from poop, like diet and health. They can also learn about patterns, like the height when the poop was dropped, whether the bird was moving or standing still, and the thickness of the bird poop. Hope that wasn't too messy. And now that your paint has dried, let's see what we see. Let's make some art. Hmm. Do you notice any patterns in our bird poop? Are the drops large or small? Does our bird poop look like yours? 
What image did your bird poop make? Hope you had fun observing patterns in your bird poop. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for exploring with us. See you next time. For more information, ask an adult to help you get to our website at californiasciencecenter.org forward slash funlabtv. See you there.